Hi there, thanks so much for watching and welcome to this video. Just going to have a last look at the advanced information for Maths A-Level Ed Excel. Paper 3, the last exam, is the applied paper and it is on Tuesday the 21st of June. So going to have a look at the advanced information and give some last minute revision tips, getting ready for the exam and wanting to thank you so much for watching my videos and also wish you the very, very best of luck for the exam. So here is the advanced information for the statistics section and they're all pretty general the bullet points the only thing to go on a little bit is the fact that we've got this change of variable when we're doing our regression line now in order to uh, make it worthwhile to calculate the line of best fit and do some regression line analysis then all the points need to lie close to a straight line but maybe in the data um, an exponential model best fits the way the scatters are um, on our scatter graph so there's two different ways we can think about an exponential model you can have y is equal to a x to the n or you can have y equals um, a b to the x now x and y are going to be our variables but of course they can be depending on what you're looking maybe you're looking at the wind speed and gust if you're looking at the large data set or maybe time and something happening but just put into the positions what's meant to be the y what's meant to be the x um, because you're always looking for the independent variable to be on the x-axis and other words that can mean you've got the independent variable it's the control variable or the explanatory variable the dependent variable always goes on the y-axis other words that can be used to describe that is the response variable the measured variable or the observed variable so knowing which one's going to go on which axis um, is a good thing to think about but then if we want to apply and take logs to both sides then you're going to have log a plus n log x for that first type for the second one you're going to have log y is equal to log a plus x log of b so in order to get our straight line so we think about the equation of a straight line y equals mx plus c so you're going to have of the form y equals mx plus c so here the n which was the power here which was the constant is going to be the gradient and you would have to log both of the variables in order to get something that looks like a straight line and log a is the y-axis intercept but with the other type if we do y equals m x i know you would write them the other way around but it's just the order that it is here plus c then you can see that the log b so this b here um, when we get our equation of a straight line the constants that's in the log b position is the gradient but in order to put it back here we're going to have to unravel the log and again the log a is going to be our y-axis intercept so sometimes you're asked to interpret but just be clear on which type that you have got now when you're doing the hypothesis testing your starting position when you're doing your product moment correlation coefficient is always your null hypothesis is that rho the population correlation coefficient is always equal to zero and then depending on the wording in the question you're either looking at the fact that the product moment correlation is less than naught if we've got negative correlation or bigger than naught if we've got positive correlation and remember the scale goes from one to minus one with zero in the middle zero being no correlation look up on the table um, to see the critical values and then anything nearer in this area is going to indicate we've got positive correlation and anything further towards the minus one we're going to have negative correlation uh, so that's things to think about for that regression line measures of central tendency and variation so when you're looking for measures of central tendency that's where is the 
data centrally located. So that is looking at your mean, median and mode. Now, when you've got symmetric data, you usually find the, the mean and the thing that goes with the mean to measure spread or variation is the standard deviation. If you've got skewed data, you usually find the median as a measure of central location and what goes hand in hand with the median is the interquartile range or some sort of interpercentile range. Now, when you have skewed data, the box plot looks like this. The median will be lower down. That will be positive skew. And when you have the box plot with the median at the upper end, that is a negative skew. And when you're trying to find the median, you might be asked to interpolate and find proportionally within which group that the um, median lies. And just remember, if you've got like 5 to 10 and then 11 to 14 or whatever, you have to make the um, either end continuous. So you'd have to do uh, 4.5 to 10.5 and then 10.5 to 14.5 or whatever. You need to make either end uh, continuous when you're going to look and find the median. Uh, probability and Venn diagrams. So you need to remember your probability rules. So when you've got the probability of A union B is going to be the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of the intersection. So if you think of a Venn diagram, when you do all of A plus all of B, You've added the intersection twice, so you need to take it away. But when you've got mutually exclusive events, the probability of A and the probability of B, there's no intersection. So that just is that part of the um, uh, formula. You don't need to take away the intersect. But if you take away the intersect, the intersect zero. So that whole um, rule and formula equation there works for any type of events anyway. And then if you have independent events, independent events, then the rules are that the probability of A times the probability of B is equal to the probability of A intersection B. And the other one is the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A. The fact that you're given B's happened has no influence because the events are independent, so it's just equal to the probability of A. If you have any events and you're doing conditional probability, then the rule for probability, conditional probability is that the probability of A given B is the probability of A intersection B divided by the probability of B. Um, so that's probability and Venn diagrams. Discrete probability distributions, this is going to be your binomial. Now, if you're going to approximate it to the normal, the conditions are that P has to be close to a half and N large. N is the number of trials and P is the probability of success. If you're doing an approximation, use a different letter. So Y would be approximately equal to the normal. The normal has mu and variance. So in terms of the uh, binomial, the discrete, then how do we calculate the mean? It's NP. And then how do we calculate the variance? It's NP1 minus P. So you know, if P is 0 0.4, then 1 minus P is 0 0.6. So the probability of P is success. The probability of failure is just the complement to um, 1. Now, I'm going to talk, I've run out of room here, so I'm going to talk about the other two on the next slide. So just going to talk a little bit about these last two, but before I do, just remembered about uh, regression lines. If we've got maybe some positive correlation and you have calculated the line of best fit, then that line is just going to be reliable for within the data range. It's going to be unreliable if you start taking readings and extrapolating out of the data range, then these answers here will be unreliable. So when you're asked to calculate and interpolate, it's that's inside the data and you can only go that way from the control variable 
to the response variable or the independent to the dependent. You can't go from the dependent to the independent the other way. So you always take readings in that direction. Okay, another thing to mention, if we're doing discrete to um, the normal distribution and approximation, if we've maybe got X being binomial and we've got our NP, say we were asked to calculate the probability that X is less than 6, then whenever you're doing a discrete distribution, this would be everything up to 6. You've got to have the equal sign in that inequality, so it would be everything up to 5. Now, when you have got the normal approximation and you've done your NP, P and NP1 minus P, then you've got to think about having this situation from the question and then you'd be calculating and doing a continuity correction. So in order to go from a discrete to a, a continuous distribution, you always go half above once you've got this equals sign in your inequality to do the continuity correction you just include half more so because this inequality is going less than i would be actually doing my continuity correction and calculating y less than or equal to 5.5 5. okay when we're looking at the normal distribution then um, um, x is distributed with a mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared that's what goes in the brackets so just be careful and remember to uh, um, if you're given the variance inside the bracket as maybe 64 then we calculate using the standard deviation so always take the square root so that would be 8 if you have to transpose and use the standard normal then that has got a mean of naught and a standard deviation and variance of 1 so the formula we use to go between two distributions to get x transposed onto z so an x value over here would be a z value over here in the same position um, proportionally and we'd use the equation z is equal to x minus mu all over sigma um, hypothesis testing you've just got to remember it's the wording of the question that tells you whether it's one tail or two tail it's not what's happened in the sample um, you know we have to look at the wording so is the wording saying that there's just a change somebody thinks there's a change or does somebody think there's an increase or decrease now if it's two tail test you have to share the significance level between both ends so you need to half each other and then if the wording says that you're looking close to the significance level then you are allowed if the readings are just um, inside the critical region so it's you know not in in the tails it's within the middle of the data you are allowed if the wording has has the word close and if you're trying to find the actual level of significance you have to use those percentages um, rather than just like the five percent or whatever uh, and the other thing the the probability percentage point table that gives you probabilities to the right of the um, bell-shaped curve so I've just included some information for you to have a look at about the large data set. So you should have an idea when the data was recorded in 1987-2015, where the weather stations are. So there's five in the UK and three international ones and have a rough idea about the ranges. So here we've got the temperature range and the wind speed. So here's an excerpt from the large data set that shows all the variables involved and their respective units. You should also be familiar with the fact that NA data wasn't recorded on those days, so it's not available. So you might be asked in your sample, uh, give a reason why you might not be able to collect 20 items from that month because in that um, total sunshine or whatever then the data wasn't available for that particular day um, tr in rainfall means trace and then look some of the variables have qualitative word data so the beaufort scale and the cardinal direction is given as uh, word data 
So in the mechanics section, it looks like we've got five questions because each of these are quite separate. So I think you're probably going to have five questions. The constant acceleration, that is all your SUVAT equations. I like to you know, list them all like that. And then the one I've not got, I think of a, um, an equation that doesn't involve that. So you do need to know all your five SUVAT equations. Newton's second law. So we're going to be applying F equals MA and using just 2D vectors. So it's just I and J for that. Variable acceleration. So you've got V is equal to and then it will be either a squared uh, quadratic equation or a cubic you need to differentiate so dv by dt is equal to a but you need to integrate um, v to get distance and remember the distance is the area under the curve if you've got the curve projectiles when you've got projectiles um, constant acceleration well the acceleration is going to be vertically due to gravity but the velocity horizontally remains constant when you've got a projectile um, dynamics when we're going to be resolving forces and then everything's in equilibrium so the forces will cancel out and you're going to have friction that is going to be mu r so maybe you've got a pulley or a connected particles or some sort of question like that statics and moments so um, lots of questions to practice for moments and you know we, we normally do all these sort of things and it's the harder type of question because friction is involved there as well wanting to wish you the very very best of luck with your uh, final exam you're nearly there you've worked ever so hard and um, you know you're going to do fine pace yourself through the exam take your time make sure you read the question get all the forces on the diagrams um, draw diagrams get more on the page so that you know exactly what's going on as you as you puzzle your way through these applied questions best of luck hoping that you get the grade that you are looking for in august and thank you so much for watching my videos